If you have a Bible, go with me over to Matthew chapter number six. Today's message is entitled Passions and Priorities. Say it with me, Passions and Priorities. And I believe that this is the pace setter message. This is literally a word I believe that God has given us that we have to run with this year. That you have to get passionate about God and we have to set our right priorities. And um, I want to look at a story over in Matthew chapter 6 verse 25 through 33. It says, therefore I say to you, don't worry about your life. And I believe that's a word for somebody today that has been a worry wart. You worry about everything. You worry about your finances. You worry about your relationships. You worry about your kids. And I want you to put worry on the altar this year. And that's a decision that you have to make. Now, if I was to be honest with you, I, am, I have a temptation to worry more than most people because I'm very proficient in faith. So whenever I do my gift assessment, I'll always score really high in faith. But people that are really high in faith usually have a greater, a greater door or opportunity to also worry at the same height. So I always have to discipline myself because I have this ability to see what's in the future and I have this ability to see things that um, are not here yet, but at the same time, I can see the worst happening. Just like I can see the best happening, I can sit around and say, okay, what if this doesn't work? And so this is a year for us not to worry because worry just shows us that we really don't trust God. And so, so we don't worry what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, or about your body, what you're going to put on. is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. We know that to be true. He says, look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they are? Which of you, by worrying, can add any cubit to your measure? What that means is that, have you ever been better because you worry? Has your, has your life ever been more successful because you worry? So why do we worry? It doesn't do anything to bring us an advantage. It only brings us a disadvantage. Somebody say amen. So he goes on in verse 28 and he says, so why do you worry about your clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil or spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? And there's a correlation between worry and faith. Meaning that if faith is high, worry is probably low. But if worry is high, it's probably because our faith is low. And I think it's important this year that we make a decision, because it is a decision, that I'm going to trust God no matter what season I'm in. Matter of fact, you have to make that decision before the storm shows up, before the attack, before the persecution, before whatever you go through, you have to decide up front that I'm not going to back front away from God, but I'm going to go after God more. That's just a, a quality decision that you and I have to make to, go, to grow through whatever we go through with the church say amen. amen. Therefore, don't worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles seek. And let's put it into context. Gentiles are simply people who do not have a relationship with God. So for those people who are not saved in the New Testament, they would be considered Gentiles. We were Gentiles. We were not, most of us were not born into a Jewish faith. So, you know, Old Testament, we'd be considered Gentiles. Oh, excuse me. <coughs> I swallowed and it went down the completely wrong way. That, that was crazy. <laughs> I'm back. But, but now when I talk about Gentiles, I'm talking simply about those who do not have a relationship with God. And so what it says is this. <clears throat> For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. I like to say it like this. God knows what you need. That should be comforting to somebody today. Did you realize that God knows what you need? God knows the relationships that you need in your life. He also knows the relationships you need to get out of your life. <laughs> he knows what job you need and what job you need to turn down. Come on, somebody. God knows what you need to have sweet sleep at night and not be wrecked with fear. God, somebody say, God knows what I need. And God knows what you need even more than you know what you need. Sometimes you think you need this, but you don't need that in your life. I love it that he knows. But here's my operating verse here. It says, verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Does anybody here love God's word? Does anybody here love God's word online? Do you love God's word? Let me know. I believe that the entire Bible is good for us. It's good for instruction. 
It's good for direction. It's good for inspiration. It's good for edification. That word simply means to build us up. And even though I know all of the Bible is God's word, it is all powerful, it is all holy, it is all true, it all can be used for our edification. There are some parts of the Bible that speak to me more than others. If I was to be honest, sometimes I read, let's take, for example, Leviticus, and I'm thinking, okay, what does that have to do with my current situation? And I know it's valuable. I know there's something in it for me. I know all of God's word is God's full counsel to me, and I, w- I don't want to devalue anything. But what I mean is at the end of a stressful day, I'm not running to the book of Leviticus. You know what I mean? Like, let's see what Leviticus has to say. <laughs> when you look at the Bible, it is so powerful. People want to discredit the Bible in our day and time. I think we should lift it up more than ever. The Bible has an old covenant and a new covenant, an Old Testament and a New Testament. It's made of 66 books with 31,102 verses. But there are certain verses that just speak to me personally. And you got to find those verses for yourself. How many of you all have found some verses that speak? See, there's some verses that I'm reading and I'm like, ah, okay. But then there's some verses I'm reading, I'm like, yeah, that's what I need. I mean, it's almost bringing refreshing to my soul. It almost brings, almost brings, come on, it's like rivers of living water where there's drought. God is beginning to speak. And there's certain verses, and I want you to know that Matthew 6.33 has been a life verse for me. And I want to share it with you today because I believe that some of your answers is found in, Mark, in Matthew 6.33. Um, and this is what it says. Let's look back at it very quickly. Ma- Matthew 6.33. The pretext, of course, is talking about worry. And we're making a decision, right, this year. I'm not going to be worrying because I'm trusting God. But it says, but seek first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness and all these other things, don't miss this because it's not just talking about taking care of your food and your clothing. The principle is that the things that you desire. Now, how many of you all this year have some things that you desire from God? Anything? Anybody here? You have? Okay. All those other things will be added unto you when you have your priorities right. Matthew 6.33 is talking about passions and priorities. Seek first the kingdom of God. Here's the revelation. God doesn't want to be second, third, or fourth. He wants to be first. He wants to be first. And my hope for you today is that you can make the quality decision that I did many years ago that I'm going to be a God first person. I made that decision that I'm going to have a God first family, that I want to have a God first church filled with God first people. And I expect for you to tap into the anointing of Matthew 6.33 that if you are a God first person, expect that all these other things are going to be added unto you because your priorities are in order. Okay? And the truth is, many of you guys who are here, God has placed you in this church because there's a call on your life. God wants to do some things in you to break generational curses in your family. That's why your family don't like you. Because you are a light in a dark place. But listen, what I found about, come on, this is what I found out. People who talk about you today will follow you on next week. Come on, somebody. Everyone has an opinion. Opinion are like noses. Everybody has one, but I don't want yours on me. And you can't allow the opinion of people that don't even know God to affect your relationship with Jesus. Are y'all hearing what I'm telling you? Everybody say priorities. And so even though you are called of God and you're here because God knows you're going to do some great things in our generation. I believe in you. I want you to begin to believe in yourself. Even though he wants to do some things in you and through you, I believe those things will be hindered if your priorities remain out of order. So we got to get our priorities straight, okay? And so you say, Pastor, well, how can I um, determine my priorities? Um, um, I'm going to give you a a key in just a minute. Uh, But priorities is just the order of your life. You, You all understand what I mean. What's first to you? Some of our priorities are out of order because we do stuff like spend more money on golf and hobbies than we do investing in our kids. And it's not that you're a bad person or evil. It's just that your priorities are out of order. You know, some of us, um, we have problems in our marriage, but we only talk to other people having the same problems in their marriage. We won't go to a pastor. We won't go to counseling. We just go to other people that will confirm the offenses that we have. And it's not that you're bad or evil. It's just that your priorities are out of order. Are y'all hearing me today? (laughs) You guys happy to be in church today. Right? Think about over the Christmas break, how many movies you watched on YouTube, how many Hallmark Christmas movies. Let me talk about myself. I watched Home Alone so many times and Christmas Story so many times. 
I watch Santa Claus one, two, and three with my kids. And it's amazing how many hours you can spend on TikTok and Instagram, but can't even spend 15 minutes with the one that made you. And it's not that you're evil or bad, it's just that your priorities. It's your priorities. So if you're here today and you say, Pastor, I want to be a God first person, how do I do it? You got to get hold of the three T's. Because putting God first is not just talk. Because it's easy to say, oh yeah, I'll put God first, but you have to show it in your actions. It's not rhetoric. It's not just talk to talk. It's walk the walk. And the first thing you do, really, if you say, how do I live a God first life, is you got to put God first in your time, your talent, and also your treasure. This is what we call the three T's. And it's an acid test so that you can locate you. Because the heart is wicked. And you can even deceive yourself like, oh yes, I put God first, but do you put him first in your time? What does that mean? That means that look at your schedule. You know how we get so busy doing everything else and they would say, well, I just ain't got time for God. You're not living a God first life. So what I would suggest is go home tonight before the new year starts or the new year has already started. I'm sorry. I don't know what today is. (laughs) In the beginning of the new year, go home and you know, y'all got Google calendar. How many of y'all got, you know, you got a schedule, wipe it clean, white slate and put God first in your schedule. That's what it means, okay? So the first thing I want you to do when you get up in the morning is spend time with God. Five minutes in the Word, five minutes of worship, five minutes of prayer. Do the thing cost the first 15. Now, don't feel bad if you miss a day because this is not legalism. This is not like if you don't do this, you're a sinner. No, these are just disciplines that will help you have success with the church. Please say amen. amen. Wipe the slate clean. Put God first. I'm talking about before you go to the gym. Come on, somebody. Before you get on email, before you get on social media, say, I'm going to get up and thank God for a day. Because when you give God the first, the rest is always blessed. It is the law of first fruits. Are y'all hearing me today? Wipe the slate clean. Put Sunday. Sunday is the day of the Lord for my home. Listen, if I miss church, my kids will be at the front door like we're going to church today, right? I'm talking about my whole family understands that we are a God first family. And so Sundays is not like a flip a coin mentality on Saturday. I'm looking at Tabitha like heads we go to church, tails we don't. What you got? No, I already know forsake not the assembly of myself together. I'm going to put God at the first of my week so the rest of my week can be better. What about midweek? Wednesday's coming up. There's going to be traffic. There's going to be all kinds of things happening. Come on, small groups. Get in a mid- and, and put that first in your schedule. Then watch this. Build the rest of your life around God having the first of your time. I'm preaching better than you saying amen over here. I'm going to go back to my T's. So we got to put God first in our time, but we also have to put God first in our what? In our talent. And some of you guys are talented. How many of you all are talented and you know it? You're gifted. I know you're trying to do the false humility thing. No, no, that's not me. Some of y'all can sing. You can play an instrument. You can do videos. You can do graphics. You're an influencer, you know. And it's amazing to me the amount of people who have God-given talents, but they won't use them to serve God. They will use their talents that God gave them just to make money, meaning that if we paid you to use your talent, you would do it till 1 a.m. in the morning. But if nobody paid you, you say, I ain't got time for that. But God is the one that gave you that ability. And there is something that has to be held back in the life of the believer that you do it just because you love Jesus. And you love other people, meaning that even if it didn't bring you increase, even if it didn't bring you a greater platform, you did it because God gave it to you. And you're going to use what he's given you to glorify his name without anybody's applause. That's what it means to put God first in your talent. But the third T is treasure. Somebody shout treasure. And if you really want to put God first, you have to put God first in your treasure. It's just like Leslie said, move God from the bottom of your budget to the top. I love to tell people that people say, I can't afford to tithe. I want you to know that's not true. Because if you got your hair done, your nails done, you're going on vacation, you can afford to tithe, but God is just not first. Your vacation is before God. Your Netflix is before God. Your Disney Plus is before God. I'm preaching right at you today because I love you on this first Sunday of the new year because we ain't got time to play because open heaven is here and open heaven is now. It's not because you're a bad person. It's your priorities that are out of order. And so this is a year for you to say, I don't care what I got to say no to. I'm going to say no to what I want so that I can say yes to what he wants. Because if I seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these other things that I've been working so hard to try to get is going to be added unto me with the church. Please say amen. 
So if you want to put God first, you have to put him first in my time. Somebody shout time. Talent. Somebody shout talent. And treasure. Somebody said treasure. Do I got any God first people that are in the house today? Any God first people in the house? And so Matthew 6.33 has marked me. And my hope is that this is scripture that will mark you. Years ago, I said, I want to be a God first man, a God first family. I want to have a God first church. But before I was a pastor, I was a businessman. And my wife and I, we were in real estate. And um, we decided early on that we wanted to have a God first business. And I actually want to show you my business card as ratchet as it, it was. This is my first business card. Now, don't laugh too much. I'm sensitive. But this is like 2000, 2001. So, and look, I look older then than I do now. The anointing, it replenishes you. It's like, it's better than like jerry curl juice. I mean, this stuff is just like, it's an anointing. It just replenishes everything. You can tell we're broke. I mean, we're broke as, as can be. We have no money at all. And you know you're broke because, you know, most people will go and they'll have a photographer take um, professional pictures. We went to Walmart. We got this picture from Walmart, y'all. Because, you know, Walmart, you can go in back in the day, and I don't know if it's like this anymore, but they have backgrounds that you can choose from. Do you want spring? Do you want summer? We, we picked the fall edition. That's the flowers that's behind us, you see. And so I was licensed in Maryland, Virginia, and D.C., and she was licensed in Virginia. So we was a husband and wife real estate team. But our first business card, <laughs> is <laughs> broken as it is on the bottom it has what we're about and this was my statement that I used putting God first and I know it's cheesy I wouldn't even recommend another business person to do that because you want to do business with Christians and non-Christians because everybody's money is green and you can also win them to Jesus in the transaction but I was drawing a line in the sand for me that I wasn't going to do business my way. See, some of you all have went to school and you're in business just to get you another Tesla or to get you new jewelry or to go on better vacations so you can brag on Instagram. But I wanted to build my business so that I could depopulate hell and populate heaven and build the kingdom of God. Those are a different set of priorities. And the truth is, is that God blessed us. Like, blessed us, blessed us. Like, $5 million worth of real estate blessed us. Like, almost a million dollars a year blessed us. Not because we were smart, just because we were surrendered to Matthew 6.33. <laughs> that says, if you seek first, not second, not third, but first. Is, any, is this thing on today? I'm, I'm talk, if you could just get bold enough to put God at the top of everything that you have going on in your life, all these other things that you desire shall be added unto you. Would the church say amen? And so Matthew 6.33, it doesn't just speak to priorities. It also speaks to passion. Somebody say passions. Because in Matthew 6.33 is a four-letter word that is filled with power. Now, I know y'all got your four-letter words. And this year, I want to ask you to give me back those other four-letter words in exchange for this four-letter word. Agreed? Nobody's agreeing. Okay, let me ask again. I want you to give me back all the other four-letter words that don't have any power, and they just bring death and destruction, and they are idle, and you will have to give an account thereof in the day of... And I want to give you a four-letter word that's filled with the glory of God. I want to give you a four-letter word that you can set the pace of your year around. Are y'all ready for this? And that four-letter word, it, it, there's 780,000 words in the Bible, depending upon your translation. But there is something anointed... Come on, Matthew 6.33. Pull it up. There it is. But seek. Somebody say seek. seek. Somebody say seek. seek. Could somebody shout seek. seek? What does it mean to seek? Write this down. It means to go after. Anybody here ready to be a God chaser this year? You don't went after everything else. It's time for you to go after God. What does it mean to seek? It means to press forward. That means sometimes I got to press through the traffic. I got to press through the haters and the naysayers. I got to press through even though I don't feel good. I'm putting my mask on, but I'm still going to the house of God because you got to press. It means that I'm going to drive forward. This is not your season to backslide. This is your season to go forward in God. Seek is the posture, the position, but it's also the passion of the heart. And from this day forward, you can make the decision that I'm going to be one who seeks God. This is the passion. If I had to give you a synonymous word with seek, write this down. 
It would be the word pursue. And I want to talk to you about having passionate pursuit this year for God. You know, I was a Christian atheist for about 10 years of my life, actually a little bit more. I define that as a person who believes in God, but lives like he doesn't exist. If you were to ask me, hey, Ken, do you put God first? Do you seek first God? I would have been like, yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. I thought that I did. I would have said, yeah, I pray over my food. I pray before I go to bed at night sometimes. I even go to church when it's convenient. And I'm sure enough better than a lot of other heathens that I knew. So, yeah, I seek first God. And really, that's where a lot of you guys are. But you have not looked at your actions in lieu of the scripture and, like, compared how you live everyday life. And this is not to put you on blast because I'm actually preaching this to me. I really feel like I'm in a season where I want to know him better and serve him more faithfully. Where I'm in a season where I want to know the heart of God. I have to know him. You know what I'm saying? I'm in a season of great thirst and great hunger because I've been saved um, for 30 some years and I've been in ministry for two decades and it can almost be like going through the motions, but I don't want the motions. I want the master. Is there anybody here that's just, I'm just done with church. I want to know him better and serve him more faithfully. I want the master. You in the right room today. And so I forgot what I was saying, but if you were to ask me, do you seek first God? I would have been like, yeah, of course I do. But there was something that was missing, passionate pursuit. And why did I lack passionate pursuit? I don't know, but I think it's because religion taught me to be passive and I didn't even know it. And that's not a slight on the churches I've been through or the camps that I come out of. That's just a revelation for those of you all who are listening, because some of you all come from churches that have taught you to be passive and you don't even know it. And your Christianity, your brand of Christianity is passive. It ain't passionate. You think about if it's appropriate to worship. You think about if I'm going to give or not. Matter of fact, you can, you can hear it in the language. The, 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 the passive people say things like, I don't know if it takes all that. If you ever have those thoughts like, ah, I don't know, I'm good with God. You know me and God, we got a thing going on right now. You know, I'll get to it later on. That is the language of the passive, not the passionate. And you can be just like me, that I thought that I put God first, but truthfully, I had no passion at all. Now, how many of you all have ever pursued something? You've been passionate about anything. Let me see by a show of hands. Have you ever pursued anything? I mean, like, I can't eat, baby. I can't sleep, baby. I can't live, baby. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Without you in my life, don't want to go on, girl. <laughs> this is my song. <laughs> now, if you don't know that song, don't worry about it. You do not need to know that song, who it was written by, who it was sung by. That had no redemptive purpose. That was only for pure entertainment. Praise God. But the heart of that is passionate pursuit. I can't live. Man. Tabitha and I first met. Man, I thought this girl was fine. I was like, whoa, boy, yeah, you know, hey, hey. And uh, we met on January 14th, 1998. First date was January 16th, 1998. Um, I remember because, God, it was... I don't, I got to move on. <laughs> but our first week, as um, soon as I met her, I took her out. First date was Boston Beanery, Morgantown, West Virginia. I took her out to dinner. And then somehow, some way, I found out where she worked at. And I realized that she just got a job working at Starnaker Hall, which was a dormitory at West Virginia University. She was working the overnight shift from midnight to 6 a.m. And I knew who her boss was. It was an African exchange student. His name was Raphael. So I went up to Raph. I said, bro. I need you to give me a job. He said, um, which, which, which dormitory? I said, Stonaker Hall. He said, what time do you want to work? I said, um, midnight to 6 a.m. He says, really? I said, yeah, I can do it. He says, you know what? I just hired a girl named Tabitha to work that. I said, really? I'm sure I can work with her. So I came in that night, you know, in like midnight, my first night. She was sitting there at the desk, and I came up, and I was like, ah. What you doing here? And she says, what you doing here? I said, I work here. She says, I do too. I say, go figure that. Who would have known? And I want you to know that's how we fell in love. Because we were together from midnight to 6 a.m. 
night after night, and you know, at 3 a.m., everything's funny. I mean, we just cracking jokes, waking up kids, leaving the front desk. It was completely ridiculous, right? And I know some of y'all think that that's stalking. There's a, there's a thin line between stalking and passionate pursuit. Come on, somebody. It's a thin line. It's a thin line between stalking. You say, what's the, what's the difference? I got fruit of 22 years of marriage. Come on, somebody. That's, that's the do doggone difference. That's, that's what it is. <laughs> Also, if you're stalking, if you're going after somebody and they want nothing to do with you, you should stop. If you go on, that's stalking. That's the difference. Okay. But you know how to pursue passionately what you want. Think about, now think about the feeling. I want you to feel this. I want you to feel this. Think about how you feel when you lose your cell phone. Ah. It feels like you lost an arm. I mean, you walking around like, oh my God, where's my cell phone? You got kids, call my cell phone. And then you tiptoe around the house because you think you might have left it on vibrate. Shh, don't say nothing. You know, you passionately pursue. You, you need your cell phone, man. You know what I mean? Right? Okay, let's take it higher. What if you lost your debit card? Like, that's another level, man. I mean, like, I'm feeling this. Like, I got to find my debit card. Like, my cell phone, I can turn it off. And it's locked. But my debit card, somebody on a spinning, spinning spree. So we got we to gotta find my debit card. I'm talking about you go in every pant pocket. You in the washing machine. You in the dryer. You in your car. You looking under the seat. You're like, oh, my God, where's my debit card, right? You know what, to, what, you know what it means to passionately pursue something that you want. Let's take it higher. How many of y'all got kids? You ever left your kid in an amusement park or lost, lost one of them? What would you feel like if you just misplaced the kid? You just lost the kid. I'm talking about you turn around and you're like, oh my God. You would be like, Johnny, Johnny, Maria. <laughs> it's a multicultural ministry. Jose, <laughs> Sue Lynn. <laughs> Are you here? I mean, you got the security. You got everybody out and everybody. You, st you can put people at the front and they looking in everybody's baby carriage. Okay, don't go out. Okay, do you have my kid? You making sure that people aren't walking out of the park with your kid, but you would do everything that is in your power and that you possibly could to pursue that what you wanted. But what about when it comes to your walk with Jesus? Why is Jesus what I have time for it if I'm not inconvenienced? When you should passionately pursue the one that has given you breath in your body, the one that has given you intellect, the one has given you grace to get through the COVID and all this stuff and you're still in the land of the living. Don't you dare think that he's just supposed to come after you. He already got on the cross, baby, and he came after you. Now it's time for you to go after him. Would the church say amen in the house of God? Woo! Come on, I got any God chases here today. You know what it means to passionately pursue something. You just got to make sure that you do it towards God. And I've tried to teach people how to be God seekers, but I don't think it can be taught. I wish that I could lay my hands on you and say, seek thee the Lord. It, ain't, it don't happen like that. I wish that we could pray and God would go into your soul and flip on the seeking light switch. It starts with a decision. That's all that it is. I know we come to church and it's like, no, I need something deeper. No, you just got to decide. For God I live, for God I die. I want him more than I want air to breathe. And some days I might not feel like reading my Bible, but I'm going to read it till I get something out of it. I'm going to seek his face this year. I'm going to say no to some things so I can say yes to some better things. That is my decision. Come on, somebody. And miracles and signs follow a simple decision. That's all that it is. You tap into the blessing of Matthew 6.33. All these things are added to you. Proverbs 25, 2. Let's look at the word of God very quickly. Proverbs 25 and 2, it says, it's the glory of God to what? Are y'all with me? It's the glory of God to conceal, but it's the honor of kings to search out a matter. So God loves to hide things from us. He loves a good game of hide and seek. He loves to close a door so that you have to knock. And then he says, knock and it'll be open, seek and you shall find. He loves to, and it's not because he wants you not to have certain things. 
He just wants to create in you a desire for passionate pursuit. That's all that it is. God is wanting to conceal things. And so when you read your Bible, there is surface reading, but then there is deeper revelation that begins to jump off the page based upon the temperature of your heart to go after him. Hebrews 11.6 says this. Hebrews 11.6 6 says, but without faith, it's impossible to what? Please him. For he who comes to God, and I believe that's you because you're here. You're coming to God, but you got to believe that he is. We live in a world that tell you that he ain't. And the devil is a liar because God is. We ain't come from tadpoles and gorillas, people. We came from the almighty God. We've been made in the image and likeness of God. You can put it together however you want, but God is. And I love this part. And he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Somebody shout, God is a rewarder. Think about that. I know we have some parts of Christianity, and I love my brothers and sisters, and they love just to hang out on the suffering side of Jesus and on the carrying your cross side of Jesus. And I thank God for that because it is in the Bible. But he's also a God who blesses, a God who promotes, a God who prospers, and a God who rewards. God knows we need both of them put together. Amen? How many of you all could handle more rewards of the Lord this year? I pray in the name of Jesus that you have all kinds of rewards of the Lord this year. You say, Pastor Ken, what are the rewards of the Lord? I'm not sure exactly what they are, but I pray if he is a rewarder of them, I pray you experience whatever rewards God has for you with the church say amen. amen. But watch this. It says that he is a rewarder, not of everybody, but of those who deal a, not just seek him, but you make this a lifestyle. Like you're a little turned up. You know what I'm saying? A lot of people don't understand why you're so excited about the Lord. Because I'm set to be a diligently seek him and you will walk in those rewards. I love Proverbs chapter number 8. Proverbs 8 says, I love those who love me. And those who seek me diligently will find me. Huh. And those who seek me diligently. You ever feel like sometimes God can't be found? Yeah. You know, some seasons of your life. It's almost like it's hard to hear the voice of God or it's hard to experience the presence of God. Anybody ever been through a season like that before? And what it really means is that you're growing. When you first get saved, it's like God's everywhere. I can hear his voice. You're like, oh, my God, I can pray in tongues. This is crazy. I mean, it's just it's ridiculous. You're like, oh, my God, I can't believe I can do this stuff. It's, it's, it's amazing. But then as you grow, he begins to say, what will you do with what I last taught you? You don't need a new word. You just need to do what I told you to do the last time. Mm. Leave that verse up for a moment. If you, if you don't mind, just keep it up for a moment. Okay? And so, Tabitha and I, we just came through a year of a cancer battle, and thank God we got the victory. But here's the deal. In our darkest moments, there was times where I didn't feel like God was speaking, and I didn't feel like God was there. Keyword, feel. Because even if you don't feel him, it does not mean that he's not there. For he said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. This ain't got nothing to do with your feelings. And in that season where I'm saying, God, why don't you heal? Why don't you move? God has used us to heal people of cancer. I believe in the healing power of God. God, where are you? Even though I could have stepped back and questioned God, I knew enough to keep on trusting him, to keep putting my faith in him, and to keep pursuing him. So truthfully... When you don't hear the voice of God or sense the presence of God, listen, it is nothing but an invitation to higher levels of maturity and pursuit. You thought God was rejecting you, and you thought he was abandoning you. The devil is a liar. You've had earthly fathers that have rejected you or abandoned you, but your heavenly father would never do such a thing. The devil loves that season of your testing because it's a spiritual fork in the road where the suggestion is God don't love you, God's not real. If he's real, why would you be going through this? And you have to make a decision at this fork in the road, whether you are gonna back up from God and say, well, I guess God's not real, I guess he's not gonna do this, I guess, or you can go the other way and passionately pursue him until you get a breakthrough. It is nothing but an invitation <laughs> to higher levels of pursuit, higher levels of intimacy, higher levels of maturity, Anybody here ready to go higher this year? 
Oh, thank you, Jesus. I'll give you one more. Psalms 105. Psalms 105. Did we already go through that one? It says, look to the Lord and his strength and seek his face. What? Always. Seek his face. Always. Seek his face. Always. Sometimes. Always. When, it's, when it's convenient. Always. When your BFF does it too. Always. When people understand you. Always. When there's not a pandemic. Always. When there is a pandemic. Always. What does always mean? And seek his face in the Hebrew actually means to seek the presence of God. For the face and the presence of God is the same in the Old Testament. Because when you see my face, it's because you've also got my presence. And so Wednesday night, our midweek service is an opportunity for our church to seek the face of God or experience his presence to a greater degree. As we come after work and we have Bible study and we have prayer, and we have middle school and high schoolers and a lot of youth. And this is what I want you to do. Because the devil is after young people like I've never seen it before. They are coming up in a culture that's filled with lies. And those lies are being sown from the time they come out of their mother's womb. And even before, when they're in their mother's womb, there's lie after lie after lie. There has never been a need for the church like right now. I want you to grab the young people that are in your neighborhood, in your family, even if their parents don't go to church here, and bring them on Wednesdays. Because we don't want to give them information. We want an impartation. We want our young people to have an encounter with God that cannot be denied no matter how much philosophy they study. Are y'all with me today? Ah. So Wednesday night is about us seeking his face always. It is a lifestyle. And so this brings us to 21 days of prayer and fasting because this is not just about what you ain't going to eat. This fast is about you seeking God. This fast is about passionate pursuit, and I want to I want to kind of build a foundation, if you don't mind, to get us ready because it starts on tomorrow. Are y'all excited about this? Okay. All right. Over the next 21 days, I invite you to take the ride of your life, to go after the heart of God with us, to go after the face of God with us, to go after the presence of God. Are y'all with me today? To say no to things that you love, steak, lobster, chicken. So that you can say yes to somebody that you love more, and that's God. Every year we do 21 days of prayer and fasting. It sets the spiritual pace of our year, and it's our time to really seek God. That's what this is about. And I want you to say amen and shout at me when I say something that you agree with. But over the next 21 days, we will see burdens removed. We will see yokes destroyed. We will see addictions broken. We will see marriages mended. We will see demons cast out. We will see the glory of the Lord enter. Come on, does anybody believe what I'm saying today? Open heaven is here. Over the next 21 days, we will see the greatest outpour of the Holy Spirit that we've ever seen in our life. Does anybody got faith for that today? Now, how many of you guys have never fasted before? Let me see by a show of hands. And I'm not talking about when you got to fast 12 hours so you can get blood drawn. I'm talking about you fasted so that you could seek God. How many of you all have never fasted to seek God before? Come on, put your hands together for all these people because we're encouraging you to make this your first fast with a live church. Come on, it's going to change your life. And I want to give you some understanding so that we can do this out of a position of faith. I never want anything that we do at this church to be like, this is what we got to do. Oh my God, I can't eat. Just eat. This is not what you have to do. This is what you get to do. So if you mess up here and there, that's between you and God. You don't have to feel guilty, bad, or ashamed, okay? This is, you're, you're choosing to do this because you want something from God, all right? This is not what we have to do. So I want to answer some common questions. What is a fast? And you can write this down if you like. It is a time of denying certain things so that you can focus more on God, okay? Denying certain things that you enjoy so that you can focus more on God, okay? All Bible fast includes putting down food for a season. Now, most of us won't do an all water fast and no food for 21 days. I've actually never done that myself. Um, uh, I think about it sometimes, but, but then I think otherwise, <laughs> praise God. <laughs> but I know Pastor Aaron, our campus pastor in Gainesville, he, he, he's done that before and there's been other people in our church, but you have to be led of God. I say this to bring liberty, you know, because sometimes as a pastor you think, oh, I know you're gonna fast. No. I'm just going to try to find what God wants me to do. So here's some different suggestions. You can do a fruits and vegetables only. You can do a six to six fast where you eat before six or after six. You can miss one meal if you want to. Just give up breakfast. Just give up lunch. 
you might just be selective in your fast. I'm going to not do this food. I'm not going to do sugars. I'm not going to do coffees. You can do whatever you're led to do. I think it should be challenging. And also, you can add some media stuff, like I'm going to put, give up video games or social media for 21 days. Now, don't just give up social media, but then go out and eat Doritos and Krispy Kreme all day. That, you're, you're not getting hold of the spirit of what we're trying to do here. You know what I'm saying? Well, well I'm fasting from, you know, I'm fasting from fasting, Pastor. <laughs> that, that, that ain't what we're talking about, for real. I mean, my God. Um, so there's all kinds. Of, now, get a fasting buddy if you're new to fasting. Um, our pastors at our church, our staff will walk through with you. Please call us. Please email us. Please stop at the Connection Center. Grab one of us. We will help you know what, what is good and what, what is not good. Um, of course, take your medication, check with your doctor, do all that disclaimer stuff. But this is really about you going after God, all right? Fasting, write this down, is not about you earning something from God or you manipulating God to do what you want him to do. Sometimes we want a new job, so I'm fasting and praying. Well, that fasting and praying ain't changing God. It's really supposed to change you. So fasting doesn't move God towards you. It moves you towards God. It's important for you to know because your fasting really doesn't change what God wants to do. It changes your ability to believe him to do what you say he's going to do. So what is our focus this year? Write this down. We're believing for the greatest outpour of the Holy Spirit we've ever seen. I need you to start to say that. Believe that with me. I can't be the only one. We're also believing God to grab the hearts and minds of our loved ones. How many of you all have coworkers, neighbors, friends? that are not saved, they don't know Jesus. Let me see by a show of hands, okay? It's an emergency. We need to see them come to Jesus. So we have a card for you that we have in your seat. Pull this out for me very quickly if you can. All right, this right here. This is what we call our hit list, but we don't call it hit list because that would scare them if they came over your house and they saw that. So we call it a prayer list, and I want you to write up to 10 people on this list that are not saved, but you're gonna believe God for them till they get saved. And see, salvation is a miracle. It makes no sense to believe in the rapture and the coming of Jesus and that some Jesus Messiah died on a cross. It has to be a supernatural revelation. So your prayer over them helps the blindfolds that the enemy has placed on their mind and the hardness of their heart be removed. You want to change the world? You start it with prayer. And so hopefully you can put this in your office, put it by your bed. Every time you look at the names, I want you to lay hands on them and we're going to believe for your family to come to Jesus. It all starts with prayer. Are y'all with me today? All right. We're going to have different kind of focuses every week as a corporate body. You can pray whatever you want to. But as a church, the first week, our focus is going to be on the nation. How many of you all know our nation is in need of prayer? Our second week is going to be on the next generation. How many of y'all know our young people are in need of prayer? In the third week, we're going to pray for each other. We're going to pray for the families and the people of a live church that God has taken you higher this year. Get ready for it. All right. And so if you have questions, check your email, check social media. We'll put out some information about how to fast. Go. We have all kinds of information on our website. But here's five points during the fast I want to encourage you with. I want to encourage you guys to come to midweek. All right. Come to Wednesday night. This will be the first one. And at least this month, come. See if you can get this a part of your spiritual rhythms. Um, if you're in Gainesville, come to Wednesday night prayer. Number two. I encourage you guys to join us for 8 a.m. prayer on Zoom. If you don't have to be at work at 9 or if you're at work but you can still kind of tune in, we all come together for about 20 to 25 minutes every day at 8 a.m. on Zoom, online. You can be in Dubai but still pray with us. We would love for you to join us. Number three, spend your first 15 with God. This is what we're encouraging our church to do through these 21 days. This is the pace setter, all right? Five minutes of the word, five minutes of prayer, five minutes of worship. If you're like me, you might need to do 30 minutes or 60 minutes or whatever, but everybody has five minutes. I'm actually going to be reading a chapter of Acts every single day if you want to read along with me. There's about 30 chapters in Acts that get us through the whole. You might, we missed a couple days. This is like January 2nd, so we can just start on tomorrow in chap, chapter number three of Acts. Now go back and read the first two and jump up with me. But uh, we're going to be looking at Acts, and we're going to ask God the way that he acted back then to do it again right now. Number four, we're going to get a prayer list. That's this. Pray over it every single day if we can. And number five, I encourage you to get here for the night of worship. This is going to be an all call for our church. I want you to take off work. Um, I want you to bring other people with you. Matter of fact, I'm going to ask every partner of our church to bring one person that does not come to church. For on this night, there will be healings. There will be miracles, signs, and wonders on January the 23rd. And at both campuses, we want to see God move. All right? Now, in closing, come on, worship team. Y'all good? What does fasting do? Fasting helps you tune into the voice and the direction of God. 
Acts 13, 2. So the Bible in Acts says that as they were worshiping and fasting, the Lord said. Some of you all need direction and instruction from God. As you fast, God's going to speak. I want you to be ready to hear the still small voice and the leading of God over these 21 days. Fasting shows your dependence and your reliance on God. Second Chronicles chapter 20 tells about a story of the king of Judah. His name was Jehoshaphat. And he heard that all of his enemies had come together to come and attack him. Now, no matter what enemy comes your way this year, Jehoshaphat shows us what we should do. The Bible says that he declared a fast throughout the nation. And then he put the worship leaders out in front of the, of, of the army. Meaning that you're going to send up Judah first this year. Don't fight out of your flesh. Don't fight out of your know-how. You got to say, God, I'm going to praise my way through this, and I'm going to do it a spiritual way. Write this down. Fasting helps you win in warfare. Daniel 12, 3 tells a story about how an angel of God was withstood 21 days. Why is that? Because there was warfare. And Daniel, at the same time, was fasting for 21 days. If you read, he let no good thing come into his mouth because he was seeking God and it was helping him win in warfare. Fasting cures our unbelief. Mark chapter 9, 29. Y'all remember the story about the young boy who had the demon and it was casting him into the flood and into the fire? They brought the young boy to his disciples. His disciples couldn't do anything with the devil. They brought him over to Jesus. Jesus cast the devil out of the young boy. Then he taught us a lesson. And he says, this kind comes out by nothing but fasting and praying. He was not teaching us that if you fast and pray, there's only certain demons are going to respond to fasting and praying. It has nothing to do with the demons. It has to do with crucifying your unbelief. So you fasting and praying causes you to believe. It evacuates the unbelief in your heart. It causes faith to rise up. It causes your fleshy, carnal man to be crucified so your spirit man can say yes to Jesus so the grace of God can flow through. And last but not least, fasting brings healing and revival. Come on, somebody. Lord, send revival. Lord, send it now. Move of your spirit, heaven break out. Come, come now, come. I thought y'all was gonna sing with me. Y'all kind of, y'all kind of just left me out there by myself. You, you don't know the word yet. It's okay. All right, but there, I got one more scripture. I think it's is it Second Chronicles seven fourteen or First Chronicles? Second Chronicles seven fourteen. Listen to this. If my people, any people of God in here, call by my name. Anybody been called by his name? Will humble themselves and what? Fasting is a form of humility. If you will fast and pray and seek my face, priorities and passions, and turn from your wicked ways, 21 days of putting your wrong ideologies on the altar, unforgiveness on the altar, bitterness on the altar, vices on the altar, perversion on the altar, pornography on the altar, addictions on the altar, bitterness on the altar, jealousy on the altar, envy on the altar, anything that's coming in between you and God, if you turn from your wicked ways, then, everybody shout then, I will hear from heaven, I'm going to forgive your sins, and I'm going to heal, sounds like revival to me, Lord send revival. Lord, send it now. A move of your spirit. Heaven break down. Come now with power. Come in this land. Like you've done it before. Won't you do it again? Lord, send revival. Lord, send it now. A move of your spirit.
worship you. Come on, can we lift up a song of worship to God? No, 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 not just clapping. Lord, we worship you. We honor you. We honor you. We bless your name. We bless your name. Come on, just begin to lift up your voice. Call him who he is. God, you're my God. You're my healer. You're my provider. You are the alpha and the omega. You are the beginning and the end. You are the one who was and is to come. You are the God of the army of angels. You are Jehovah Jireh, my provider. You are Jehovah Shalom, my peace. You are Jehovah Sid Kanu, my righteousness. You are Jehovah Nisi, my victory. God, you've already given me victory. Victory over depression. Victory over sickness. Victory over my attitude. Victory over my past. Victory over everything that has held me back in the name of Jesus. God, send revival. Send it now. God, we worship you. Come on, church. Come on, church. Let's worship God. Let's worship our King. Come on, lift up our voices and lift up our hands. Come on, begin to Shabbat God live. We love you. Come on, let's give him a king to praise. Hallelujah. This is our highest form of praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Open heaven is here. Open heaven is now. Open heaven is here. Open heaven is now. Open heaven is here. Open heaven is now. Open heaven is here. Lord, sing it Hey. Come on, you sing. Heaven. Come now with power. Come with this land. Like you've done it before. Let's do it again. Come on. Sing it again. Hey. Lord, sing it. Father, I pray that right now your presence begins to fall in this congregation as we seek your face. I pray that as we make a decision to be God chasers, that all these other things that the Gentiles seek, all these other things that we've been desiring of you, that you begin to add to us because we're making the decision at the beginning of this year to put first, not second, not third, not for, but first, oh God. I thank you that you watch over your word. In Jesus' wonderful name. Oh. I want to I wanna pray for you guys and give you an opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of your life. And so, with every head bowed and every eye closed very quickly, um, if you're here today watching online and you can admit that you've ever sinned in your life salvation starts at humility the Bible says we've all sinned we've all fallen short of the glory of God so if you've ever sinned in your life here's the truth you deserve hell because of the holiness of God but God doesn't give you what you deserve he gives you grace grace is favor that you cannot earn and that you don't deserve. You say, why would God give a sinner like me grace? Because he loves you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever, no matter your background, no matter your race, no matter your gender, no matter what you did last night, but whoever would believe would not perish but have everlasting life. I want to offer you an invitation to the greatest gift ever. It's a relationship with God, not a religion but a relationship with God. And it starts with you saying yes. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here today and you say, Pastor, I've sinned, but I want forgiveness. I want a relationship with God. I want to start my year off knowing that he's first in my life. On the count of three, I'm going to have you lift your hand so that I can know who I'm praying for. I will acknowledge it, and then you can put your hand down. That's just you reaching your hand to heaven. On the count of three, if that's you, one, two, three. Lift up your hand and say, Pastor, I want to be saved. I want to be forgiven of my sins. I see your hand, 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 your hand. 
Anybody else? Your hand in the back. Your hand over here. Okay. I got one more appeal for you. Maybe you're saved and you've prayed the sinner's prayer before, but you haven't been living for God and you want to rededicate your life to the Lord today. There is an opportunity that the Holy Spirit wants to give you just to make a heart decision to recommit back to him. If that's you today on the count of three and you say, Pastor, pray with me. I want to recommit my life to God this year. I've been away, but I'm coming home. If that's you, lift your hand on one, two, three, lift it up high. Thank you. I see your hand, 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 your hand. You in the right place. Come on. Put your hands together. Welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. Nobody prays alone. Everybody, we're going to pray this thing together. Repeat these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart today. Forgive me of my sins. From this day forward, I'm yours. You're mine. I believe that you died on a cross just for me, but you rose with power in your hands so that I could rise from death and sin to eternal life. I accept you as my Lord and my Savior in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, church. Come on. You can do better than that. Come on, church. This is the way we start the new year. Come on, y'all ready one more time? Hey! Lord, save me now. Lord, send it now. The move of your spirit. Heaven break out. Come now in power. Cover this land. That you've done it before. Won't you do it again? So those of you all who made that decision to recommit your life to Jesus, those of you all who got saved today, we love you guys. Welcome to the family of God. All right? Now, today, salvation is an event, but growing in God is a process of renewing your mind. If you really want to passionately pursue God, your next step would be growth track. Somebody say growth track. We actually have step one happening today. If you can give us 45 minutes, we'll help you get connected to the church. Get connected to God, discover your purpose, make a difference. If you give us two weeks, we can take you through those three steps. You won't be perfect at the end of those, but you will be passionately pursuing and saying, God, I'm putting you first. If that bears witness with you, 10 minutes after service, just meet us at the growth track room, and we're going to help you come on into step number one today. We love you guys. We will see you next, next Sunday. God bless you. Thank you so much for tuning in to a live online today. Hey, if this message blessed you, I just encourage you to share it with a friend because we believe at a live church that one invite can change a life. And if you want to keep in contact with us and know what's going on, be the first to know about it, make sure you click on our subscribe button so that you can keep up with all of our latest content. And hey guys, if you love our church and just want to be a blessing and help support the ministry, you can give at mylivechurch.org give. We love you guys and we'll see you next time.